Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, so the name of the game is Learning with Errors, and lo and behold, here is once again uh, Learning with Errors. So Learning with Errors goes back to the work of Oded Regev, um, and um, what you're given is a tuple AC, so where A is a matrix, M by N mod Q. And your job as the adversary is to decide if AC is either uniform, so C is also a uniform vector, or if C was formed like uh, shown on the slide, so you have A times S plus E, where E is small. And in this formulation, which is the old school formulation, kind of S is uniform, but as you might know, there's a normal form of LWE where you pick S also from the same distribution as the arrow E. So you can also think of that as somewhat small. Okay, so LWE is kind of everywhere, but for the purpose of this talk, I only care about two applications. Um, in particular, you can build homomorphic encryption from LWE. Um, so for example, the BGV scheme, um, which is implemented in HELIP, which is IBM's uh, homomorphic encryption library, um, goes down to uh, LWE, and the FV scheme, uh, which is implemented in SEAL version 2, which is Microsoft's homomorphic encryption library, also uh, relies on the hardness of the LWE problem. Right, so you want to kind of look at LWE if you want to convince yourself that uh, these uh, libraries are secure. So what these libraries do, and many other construction cryptography do, is they don't pick the secret as I've just told you. Right? So the secret is neither uniformly random, nor does it follow the normal form or either error distribution. In particular, what HELIP does, it chooses the secret such that you have the guarantee, typically, you can, you can, you can change that, but by default, or what you kind of encourage to do, shall we put it like that, is there are 64 entries which are non-zero, and so they're minus one or one, and every other entry if in dimension n, regardless of dimension n, will be zero. So it's very sparse. S seal, uh, in contrast, picks uh, the secret uniformly at random from the set minus one, zero, and one. Right? So it's not sparse, but it's still um, short. And so the natural question to ask at this point is um, how much security does this cost? Right, so we have this LWE problem, we have some understanding of how hard is it to solve, and then kind of here we have uh, an adaptation, right, a variant of it, and the natural question, well, does it cost you any security or not? Um, if you ask uh, theory, so if you want to have some strong guarantees and you want to look at reductions, then this theory tells you actually in order to achieve the same security for your binary secret, so that's not even sparse, it's just a binary secret, then you have to extend the dimension to n log q, right? So you have quite a bit of blow up in the dimension of your LWE problem. On the other hand, if you look at actual constructions, then this issue is typically simply ignored, right? So normally kind of security analysis proceeds by saying, we're going to uh, pretend like this is a, a no, an LWE normal form, and then we're going to kind of choose parameters based on that, because really you can't do much better with a binary secret, right? And so again, question, which one is it? Okay, so let's look at um, how you would kind of pick your parameters, what kind of um, attacks you would consider. Um, you can roughly, uh, for these kind of uh, schemes where the dimension is very large, it really boils down to lattice attacks, uh, so combinatorial attacks don't really play a role in this, um, this world. Uh, so you can either uh, mount a primal attack, which means you find some linear combinations of the columns of A that gets you close to C, um, and then so you're solving the bounded distance decoding problem as uh, mentioned in the previous talk. The way you can do this is either you run some enumeration as just discussed, um, or you um, embed um, your problem into another lattice and then solve some unique shortest vector problem. Other approach, you solve the short integer solutions problem also previously mentioned. Um, so you find a short W such that W times A is zero mod Q. And then when you uh, take the inner product of your W with C, uh, and C was indeed formed, um, as i shown you, A times S plus E, then you get an inner product of uh, W and E. W is short, E is short, inner product is short. Because in cryptography, inner product of two short things is always short. <coughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> OK, so how do you uh, execute that? Um, um, in more detail, um, you run some lattice reduction, and um, in this talk, um, I'm only kind of going to take a very high-level view of lattice reduction. Uh, you, you run lattice reduction on this uh, dual basis, 
and then you get a vector that has length uh, delta naught to the m um, times the volume of the lattice to the power of 1 over m. And the volume of the lattices that we construct here is q to the n, so you end up with this formula. Right, so you construct this dual, dual uh, basis for the dual lattice, you run your lattice reduction algorithm, and then you check if these inner products um, are small, and then you conclude this looks like an LWE instance, or you conclude otherwise. And this delta naught depends on the lattice reduction algorithm. So the better, the higher the block size, the more expensive the algorithm, the smaller this delta naught, and the smaller this vector short, uh, V. Right, okay, so as I've just described, you, you try to find some short V, and then you take the inner product of V and E, and you check if that is, uh, looks very much not like a uniform distribution. So there's clearly a trade-off here, right? The shorter your V, um, the better you can distinguish the end inner product uh, from uniform, but also, as I've just mentioned, uh, the harder it is to kind of actually get something this small, right? So there's a trade-off between running time and distinguishing advantage. And on this slide, what I'm plotting you for some particular instance uh, under some particular BKZ cost model, uh, if you pick your favorite cost model, it wouldn't look too much different. Then you see, if I just decrease the distinguishing advantage to, say, 1 over 1,000, then my cost in BKZ drops rapidly, right? So for the first, kind of like going to maybe to the minus 10, kind of is beneficial, going maybe to minus 30, kind of doesn't really make much of a, um, doesn't give me much of an advantage. Right, and of course, kind of you're kind of comparing two strange things, right? So two algorithms that have different success probabilities. So maybe you want to normalize, right? And so how would you normalize? You say like, well, okay, I can solve with low advantage for each of my instance. Then I run my experiment sufficiently often to do majority vote to still have uh, some constant distinguishing advantage. We are having a decision problem, so you have to run this roughly one over epsilon squared times, um, and then you end up with a plot that looks something like that. And indeed, kind of in each instance, you want to target maybe something to the minus 10 as your uh, individual distinguishing advantage. Right? Okay, a brief word from our sponsor. Um, okay, so the uh, discussion so far was, was premised on, and the, the plot that I've just shown you, uh, was premised on the assumption that if you want to have 1 over epsilon squared short vectors, you have to run BKZ 1 over epsilon squared times. Right, but this is not necessarily true. Because um, right, the kind of outline that I gave you is like take a random basis, kind of do your reduction, take the shortest vector that you found in your new reduced basis, and check if the inner product is short. But after we've done all this kind of hard work of getting a short basis, why don't we kind of start re-randomizing there? And this is indeed actually what, uh, what we do in uh, lattice reduction libraries when we do this extreme pruning and we want to re-randomize. You want to re-randomize in a way that doesn't completely destroy all the hard work you've done. Right, so a very simple heuristic approach is to say, let's take my basis L, let's run lattice reduction in block size beta, and then um, instead of kind of starting from scratch each time, I'm starting from this already reduced uh, basis. I'm going to do some light re-randomization, right? Some sparse, small uh, unimodular matrix that re-randomizes my basis, and then I run some BKZ with some beta prime, which is maybe smaller than beta, and I still get something out that's okay, right? And uh, this whole thing is very heuristic and very hand wavy. All I have to offer you is some experimental evidence in block size 60 or 70 that tells us actually this is this is more efficient than just doing it from scratch. And there are clearly many questions of kind of like how does it you know, how does it really behave, and can you really argue that you get something that's sufficiently random, but um, we can give you some empirical evidence that it seems to be okay, at least for the uh, instances that we looked at. Okay, so that brings down the cost somewhat, right? So instead of running one over epsilon squared BKZ instance in block size beta, you only run them in smaller block sizes. All right, moving on. Now this, because what I've told you so far really has nothing to do with small secrets, right? I promised you small secrets, so let's talk about small secrets. So the first kind of observation is, well, actually we don't need V times A is zero, right? Because the secret is also small. It's actually enough to find some V times A such that W is also small, right? So if you look at the normal form of the dual attack, um, then um, you have some x and y, x times a um, is congruent to y, and then if you have something short there and you multiply through, you get an inner product of w with s, which is short, and an inner product of v and e, both of which are also short, right? So that's great. 
And then the next thing that you want to do is S, as I've just described, is actually much shorter than E. Right? So you want to give the algorithm the freedom to say, like, you know what, you get to pick a bigger W. Because we don't need W of the same kind of quality as V because we're multiplying it by something that's smaller in the end. Right? And so if you do that, then that means you just scale a few columns of your lattice. Um, and then um, you can go back to some work by uh, Shibai and Stephen Galbraith where they did this for the primal attack. And this is just kind of applying this trick uh, to the dual attack. Right? And then what you end up with is some constant times your W in a product S and your V and E. And then if things are small enough, then you still win. And the advantage of the scaling is that uh, this has a kind of quite significant impact on the determinant of your lattice, which in turn determines uh, kind of how big your uh, vector is. Right, so to figure out the C, that also is pretty straightforward, right? So you just kind of try to balance the contribution of the two sides, and then there's kind of some really trivial algebra to get your constant C out, and you're done. And in this uh, formula on the slide, H is the sparseness of the secret, right? So if you're only multiplying it by 64 non-zero entries, then you can afford to have each of the things that you multiply with to be a bit bigger, because you're not adding up N or M. Okay, so this was um, um, on s small secrets. Let's talk about sparse secrets. And here the key point is, okay, so we, we're working really hard to find a vector V such that when I multiply it from the left by A, I get a zero. But most of the columns are completely irrelevant. They, will, they, have, they play no role in the, in the final result, right? Because S at that index is zero. So I don't need to do all this work, right? I don't need to work really hard to make the linear combination zero if the thing doesn't matter in the end, right? So let's just ignore them. Like, that's literally what I'm going to propose you. Uh, let's just ignore some columns. And so if you then kind of think about, well, what is my probability of success? Well, I have dimension n, right? So I have uh, n balls, and then h of them are non-zero, right? They are unlucky ones and then I'm just kind of uh, sampling uh, from these bolts without putting them back, and I ask myself, well, what's the probability of getting lucky every single time? And you're looking at a hypergeometric distribution, so it's pretty uh, straightforward to work out how often can you guess, and how much does it, uh, how does it affect your success probability. Right, so you just ignore some columns, and then you solve the smaller instance, which is easier to solve, right? Smaller dimensional lattices are easier to reduce. Um, and then if you got lucky, great, kind of you have distinguished your instance. If you got unlucky, you have to do it again. And of course, then your algorithm that you run, kind of one over PK times, has to succeed with sufficiently high probability so that you can actually distinguish. Right, and so here's how this looks like. And I should mention, like in my world, vectors kind of are either column or row vectors, depending on what the dot product wants from them. So uh, please excuse uh, kind of that abuse of notation. Right, so what I'm trying to do is I do, uh, I want to find some small vector v. When I multiply it by a, um, I get something zero in, uh, in the uh, right-hand side of the column, so from index k to uh, n minus one. And then, um, and I'm asking myself, do I get zero? And I get zero whenever the first k uh, entries of s in this particular instance, if they are zero. Right, so my v, act vector v makes all the uh, bilinear combination makes all the components starting at k zero, and then because s naught to s k minus one is zero by assumption, then that kind of zeroes out the remainder, right? So I get lucky if I have my SIs up to k if they are all zero. Now let's look at what I get. What happens if I get unlucky, right? So me getting unlucky in the instance that I'm looking at is I either have a one there or I have a minus one there, right? So let's assume I have a one there. Well, then the final thing that I'm getting is actually the, uh, my vector v in a product with a, um, and then I get this a naught naught prime, right, which is just the inner product of these guys. So I still get uh, some, some distribution that I can understand. Right? I have this small thing, and it's shifted by something that I know. Right? I know a naught naught prime, and then I have something small, uh, some small noise, the inner product of w and s and v and e. Right, so this suggests um, of uh, you know, some form of post-processing. I've done all my kind of hard lattice reduction, which is really expensive, and then instead of just saying like, oh no, this thing doesn't look small, let me look for all these shifts, because that's a, that's a cheap thing to do. 
So again, you're looking at some hypergeometric distribution, and now you're asking myself, uh, yourself, it's like, okay, I'm ignoring uh, k minus j columns, and they're all zero, and j of them are actually, I got unlucky. Right? The establishing the probability is easy, and that's how often you have to then kind of repeat the experiment. But now, of course, this is much cheaper because you run your lattice reduction once, and then you do these really cheap kind of checks. You check for many different distributions. Of course, you want to make sure that the uh, advantage of distinguishing is high enough so that you know when you found the right one, because now you have to win against all these other checks. Okay, so uh, these are the three kind of fairly straightforward ideas um, that I want to talk to you uh, about. And so if you put everything together, we arrive at our final algorithm, which we call circuit. So um, the, uh, it's a variant of the dual attack for small and sparse secrets, and here's what it does. So you run your BKZ beta uh, reduction once, and then you run your BKZ beta prime reduction for some small beta prime for, uh, to produce many short vectors from all the hard work you've done. And then uh, the actual kind of dual attack that you run, you scale it kind of as inspired by um, Shi Bai and Stephen Galbraith's paper. And then finally, if your secret is sparse, then you play this uh, game where you ignore some components and you do this post-processing uh, if you to deal with kind of getting unlucky. All right. And then so putting everything together, kind of here's what you get. So um, looking at SEAL, so this is, I should stress, this is SEAL 2.0. Uh, so they, uh, the parameters were updated in SEAL 2.1. Uh, so in SEAL 2.0, um, the paper kind of contained uh, values for, for log Q that should give you 80 bits of security. Right, so in all these uh, instances, um, what you have is uh, this, the standard deviation of the noise is always 3.2. Um, and then, uh, right, then essentially, if you want 80 bits of security, then the size of Q becomes a function N. Right, and they're saying like, well, you can go for Q up to 47.5, so to the 47.5, and you still have 80 bits of security. Okay, so for the same instance, if we just kind of using our kind of cost estimates for how long does it actually uh, take to run lattice reduction, then we get 83 bits of security, right? So this is kind of our kind of cost model about kind of how long does it take to just run the dual attack as it was described in 2009 or earlier. Okay, and then when you actually start using the fact that you have small secrets, um, then you get this down to 68. Right, so that's what the circle small. So small stands for we're using uh, the um, we're using the uh, small secret, but we're not using the sparse secret. Sorry. And then HELIP, right? So the difference between SEAL and HELIP is that uh, HELIP uses a sparse secret, um, and so you uh, again kind of uh, lock Q uh, is what you would get kind of using the cost estimates from the HELIP paper, and then you exploit the sparse secret, you get this down to 61 bits and then you can play the same game for 128-bit security, and the gap is even bigger. All right, that's all I want to say. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we do have some time uh, for a few questions. What does Silke stand for? Thanks. Uh, so it's, uh, as you do, it's named after a goddess of wisdom and wit. Uh, but if you are looking for a backronym, then you can take comfort in the fact that SIS, BKW, LWE, all the letters are there. And then I'm sure we can work something out offline of a cool name. Uh, can you remind us uh, how many samples from the uh, LWE problem do you need? And, uh, how many samples the uh, HELIP and uh, mm -hmm. uh, SEAL provide? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can do it with one sample. So one ring LWE sample. So that's N LWE samples, and this is what you get. So uh, there's no, like, so this is assuming that you're using only the number of samples that is provided by the scheme. Size of the noise are not the same. Uh -huh. um, do you have a sense of um, how much savings you get from each of these ideas? 
Uh, yeah, so we kind of, we, we have a running example in the paper where we spell this out, and then so to give you the overview, like clearly this sparse thing doesn't apply to seal, right? So we can, and so silica small also only has the amortizing costs and the, the scaling, and the amortizing costs, it doesn't, for these instances, doesn't make that much of a difference, maybe five bits, so uh, for this particular instance, it really is the scaling kind of that makes a big difference, it seems. Um, but for the primal attack, on the other hand, no. If you run uh, Shee's and Stevens algorithm on these instances, or you can, you know you run your estimator on that, you get like three bits. Um, so it really depends on kind of where you apply and then what you get out. 